All right, so when we're analyzing DNA samples, I just wanted to make you aware of a couple of things. So this is a picture of an electrophoresis of supposedly a sample from a crime scene here, and then they're comparing it to, uh, looks like, seven suspects. Um, if we look at this, so the DNA would have traveled this way, and what we're looking for if it's a crime scene is that the person would have to match the crime scene exactly in their band pattern. So if you notice, person number three would be our guilty suspect or the person who's, whose sample matches the crime scene. Um, however, here's the thing. In reality, this is not what the police department's going to look at. In other words, the police, it, it's not like TV where the police people are hanging out with the lab people and they're all looking at this together, going over it, going, oh yeah, it looks like they're a match. That's not what happens. What would actually happen is this. The, um, the crime lab would test the sample. They would get an electrophoresis. But they would, they would basically be testing several different test sites on the DNA, cut sites. Um, and so, for example, let's say I'm testing three different sites. Now, what do I mean by sites? Again, I mean an area of the DNA that's cut by a restriction enzyme. This area of the DNA might not even code for anything. We're just, but, um, but these are sites where a restriction enzyme cuts. So if they just tested one site, and if I tested everybody in this room, and I tested just one cut site, for certain particular sites, it might turn out that the person is a match to 50% of the population. In other words, one cut site is not going to give you a DNA fingerprint. It's not going to be unique to you. 50% of people may get the same exact band pattern as you for that one site. So what they might do is they would test, say, 20 different sites. So I have a sample here with testing just three cut sites. So let's say and, and again, they would have on file what percent of the population, based on thousands, millions of people, match, you know, would have a particular pattern. So let's say at site one, you match 50% of the population. So 50% of people in the world would probably have the same exact band pattern as you for that site. At cut site two, 40%. At cut site three, 30%. So if they wanted to know um, what are the chances that a person would match you at all three cut sites. Well, if you change your percents to frequencies and do 0.5 times 0.4, again, I'm just changing my percent, dividing by 100, times 0.3, and multiply those together, I get 0.06, which would basically be 6 in 100 people. Or if I turn this back into a percent, multiply it by 100%, 6% of the population would match me at all three of these sites. Now, that's still a lot of people, right? 6%. But the thing is, they test like 20 different sites. So what will actually come back to the police um, in the report, um, and I actually have one here, it says that these are the sites that were tested. This is from DNA evidence collected from a window, blah, 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 blah. And it says the frequency that the DNA profile matching person X would be expected to be found in another person in the population is 1 in 26 billion 200 million. Because they tested so many cut sites and used, again, the product rule, the chance of somebody else having the same exact pattern at site 1, site 2, site 3, at every one of these sites as this person is more than basically the number of people on Earth. And so the pattern does become a unique fingerprint to the individual person. But I did want you to understand that in reality, the police are not looking at a picture. They don't get from the lab this picture and look at an electrophoresis. This is also how like Ancestry.com works. Um, I have my DNA for Ancestry and I get emails all the time. We found somebody that we think might be your second or third cousin. How are they figuring that out? They're looking at how much of their DNA matches mine. Because if they were my parent, 50% of their DNA should match mine. If they were a sibling, about 25% of their DNA should match mine. And as we go further and further out, you know, my cousin, my aunt, my second cousin, etc., less and less of the DNA would match, but it would still be more of a match than the general population. And that's how they're sorting that out. So this could be used for all kinds of things, for genealogy, you know, relationships, even in classifying a new species they discover. They can compare its DNA to similar organisms and figure out where they should classify it. Now. Uh, the other thing I wanted to cover really quick, when we're analyzing DNA fingerprints, um, again, crime scene, you need to match exactly. If they identify a body, it would have to match the DNA exactly to be that person. But for 
eternity. This is important. You're not going to match your child exactly. So I want to show you a sample problem like you could see on a test where I give you a DNA sample and I ask you to match the person. So here is an example. This is from your homework. So I have three babies and we're trying to match each baby to who their parents are. So again, here's the wells at the top where the DNA started, the DNA traveled. So let's try baby one. So what I, go, what I do is I go through each band in baby one and I see who shares that band with them. So I notice, aha, male from couple B matches baby one. Let me see if any other uh, bands from male B match baby one. This one does, and it looks like this one does, and that's it. Notice not every male uh, band from this male matches the baby. That makes sense. Remember, you only give half of your DNA to a child. Now, to make sure we're right, every band that didn't come from dad has to have come from mom. So if we're correct that it's couple B and it's this male and this female, the other three bands in this baby have to be in the female. So now I'm going to check those three bands. Um, and I see band one, yep, the mother has it. Band two, yep, the mother has it. Band three, yep, the mother has it. Now notice this mother also has it, but I know that this mom here in couple A cannot be the mom of this baby. Because remember, every band that didn't come from dad, so this one, this one, and this one, dad have, that means these three all have to be in the mother, these pink ones. And this woman only has one of those three bands. She does not have a band in this spot, and she doesn't have a band, oops, in this spot, so she can't be the mother. So you could see the scenario like this, so now we know baby one belongs to couple B. But uh, another scenario you could see on a test is where I tell you the baby and the mom, and then I say, okay, which one of these guys is the dad? Um, and again, what you would do is if I say, hey, uh, baby, you know, um, this dad, let's just say, is the father of, let's say, baby two. And I say, which one of these females is the mom? I mean, pretend like they're not, at, you know, in couples. Then what you would do is you would take baby two and you go, okay, well, this band came from him, this band came from him, and this band came from him. That means the other three bands have to come from the mother. So then I would sort through my three mothers and see which mother has all three of those bands. If that mom does not have all three of those, that can't be the mother. So again, this one's organized into couples, but that would be another scenario. So you need to be able to match DNA to a crime scene, but you would also need to be able to match a baby to a parent. And so that is done a little differently. You would be looking for half the bands to come from each parent. So hopefully that explains it.